24 Simposio Internacional SOMESI 2021. Transformación digital e innovación educativa. ¿Qué tal? Eh, buenos días. Bueno, más bien ya son buenas tardes. Es un gusto saludarlos y presentar a ustedes la siguiente conferencia magistral. Eh, seguramente ustedes han notado que a lo largo de este simposio, desde que inició eh, hoy a las 8 de la mañana, se ha mencionado en repetidas ocasiones el método de aula invertida como un método a seguir en esta coyuntura socioeducativa que nos encontramos entonces, es verdaderamente un lujo contar con la presencia del líder educativo John Berman. Eh, cuando el doctor John Berman empezó a enseñar en 1986, lo hacía de forma tradicional y se consideraba un buen conferencista. Pero después de 19 años de enseñanza, se dio cuenta de que tenía que haber una forma mejor. John es uno de los pioneros del movimiento Flip Classroom o Aula Invertida y lidera la adopción mundial del aprendizaje invertido. Eh, ha trabajado con gobiernos, escuelas, empresas y organizaciones educativas sin ánimo de lucro. Eh, John ha coordinado y guiado proyectos de aprendizaje invertido en todo el mundo, en los lugares en los que ha trabajado. Por ejemplo, se encuentra China, Taiwán, México, por ejemplo. A mí me tocó conocerlo justamente en un taller que dio en la Universidad Iberoamericana hace algunos años. Eh, también ha trabajado en Corea, en Australia, en Nueva Zelanda, Oriente Medio, Islandia, Suecia, Noruega, Reino Unido, España, Alemania, India, Sudamérica y, por supuesto, Estados Unidos. Eh, John Berman es autor de 10 libros, entre ellos el más vendido se llama Flip Your Classroom, que ha sido traducido a... 13 idiomas. Él ha sido educador durante 34 años, con 26 años como profesor de aula. En el 2002, eh, John recibió el premio presidencial a la excelencia en la enseñanza de las matemáticas y las ciencias. Y en el 2010, fue nombrado semifinalista para el profesor del año de Colorado. También forma parte del consejo asesor de TED Education además de recibir, de escribir y hablar sobre Fit and Mastering Learning o aprendizaje invertido de dominio, John enseña ciencias en tiempo completo y dirige el desarrollo de personal en la House School, en la Houston Christian High School. ¿Okay? Puede usted saber más sobre él en el sitio johnbergman.com. Okay. Entonces, sin más, vamos a escuchar la presentación de John Berman, titulada, eh, el título es una pregunta, Rethinking Education, How Flipped and Mastering Learning Can Help Us Post-Pandemic, Repensando la Educación, Cómo el Aprendizaje Invertido de Dominio Puede Ayudarnos Después de una Pandemia. Mientras John da su conferencia, nosotros vamos a estar poniendo atención a sus comentarios, ya sea en Facebook o en YouTube. Y, y vamos a, eh, a interrumpir más o menos dos veces la, la conferencia para ponerlo al tanto de, de las preguntas y, y que nos vaya te, eh, dando una retroalimentación sobre esos comentarios. Pues adelante, John. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. As, as I said in Spanish, I mean, uh, since this uh, symposium started at eight o'clock, uh, every single lecturer has mentioned um, flip classroom. Okay, so uh, it's your turn. So I have a lot to uh, stand up to. <laughs> Everyone's talking how awesome flip learning is. And uh, I agree, I think it's awesome. But uh, what we want to do today is, uh, first of all, I want to just say thank you. Let me get my uh, presentation up here. Uh, I want to say thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you all. And, uh, oops. <laughs> Set that wrong. and uh, yeah, me, me gusta Mexico. Uh, 
visitar el México muchos tiempos. Uh, yeah. So how do we rethink education? especially when we think about flipped and mastery learning, how can it help us in a post-pandemic world? Now, I'm also realizing that the pandemic has been such a hard thing for all of us as teachers. It's been hard for us in the in Estados Unidos. And I know it's been especially hard for those of you who are in Mexico and in all of Latin America. And I understand that. But I want to start with just an interesting thing. I, I did this a number of years ago before the pandemic. I Googled the word classroom followed by a country code, right? And this is what I found. This is what a classroom looks like in the Estados Unidos, Taiwan, Japan, Uganda, Tibet, Egypto, Medio Oeste, China, India, the Himalayan mountains, Montañas de Himalayan, Vietnam, Peru, in rich countries, in developing countries, uh, professional development or adult learning, in the military, and in prison. So that's what classrooms look like before the pandemic, right? And then I, I, I oh, and here's ones in Chile. And um, I want you to imagine a world though where we live in a pandemic world. And so I thought I would do the same exercise and ask the question, what do classes look like in the pandemic? So I, 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 demo, I Googled COVID in school with images, and these are the pictures that I found. Taiwan, Argentina. Remember this in empty classroom teaching on Zoom? University of Oklahoma, Pantheon University, Francia, Japan, University de Kentucky, the Vatican, South Korea, the United Kingdom, or just as what your class looks like, just somewhere on Zoom. This is Stanford Medical School. That's how they've been doing it. Furman University, Harvard University, Indonesia, South Korea, Brookings Institute, New York University, Estados Unidos. So what are we facing? What is that we're gonna face when and if we ever get done with this pandemic, and we will, folks, we're going to be done with this pandemic. You know, a que nos entrafamos? What are we going to face? Um, and I think the answer is we're facing, and I'm seeing this in my class, I'm sure you are too, is we're seeing a uh, learning loss, perdida de aprendizaje. We're, we're facing students who are lost. So right now I teach uh, high school, so secondary school, 16. Uh, 17, 17, 17 y 18 uh, estudiantes. Uh, um, they have, they're, they're, they're 17 and 18 years old. They are behind. Uh, I, I teach chemistry and physics. And as I'm really discovering, particularly my students are coming in with very significant mathematical gaps. They have learning loss. And that's what I'm seeing in my classes. And I know you're going to see this or you've already seen it. And here's an interesting study um done by the world bank they had they studied 120 million of the regions now this doesn't include mexico it's central and south america and they they uh, asked the question you know basically what have they lost there and then they they studied you know uh many millones de niños uh, and they said what kind of a loss are the students having and this is what they said they said learning losses will be substantially larger for children in the lowest income quintile, widening the already high socioeconomic education achievement gap by 12%. So World Bank in 2021 this year said that, that we are we're facing a, a crisis of students who've lost a year of, of learning, maybe, or something like that, right? And, and even if you teach in an exclusive university in in Mexico or Chile or Peru or wherever you're from, you're seeing the same thing. I teach at a, a, a school that is kept open most of the time through the pandemic, and we're seeing the same learning losses. And it's going to be much, much worse if you are teaching students who have been in Zoom classes for a long period of time. In the World Bank study, they made six key recommendations. Here they are in Spanish. And I really want to just focus on one of them. Uh, I won't, I'll just zoom in on that one right here. And that's this one. And this is that teachers, the big recommendation from the World Bank is that teachers and principals will need to be supported 
to obtain the skills to optimize the alteration, alternation of in-person and remote activities so that you'll be able to go back from in-person and to remote activities. So this is one of the huge recommendations. And I don't know if you've seen this, but I have, is that I've seen so many teachers, even though I continue to teach, I have this great privilege of having opportunities opportunity to, to interact with teachers all over the globe. And next week, for example, I'm speaking via Zoom or whatever in Chile. Uh, last week I was speaking in India. It, 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 it you know changes. So I, I'm connecting with educators globally. And as I learn from this, this is a problem that we're seeing all over the world is that teachers were unprepared for the pandemic and they continue to feel unprepared for the pandemic. And maybe those of you who are tuning in on Zoom or in uh, uh, YouTube or Facebook, whatever, that you are also feeling that pinch, how, I, how you feel unprepared. So now what I'd like us to do is, based on that really quick introduction, I want you to have some Q and A. And it's really, I want you to focus in on how did you, are you reacting to those images that I just showed? Just, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts and maybe a question or two. Okay. Okay. Uh, for now, we, we have basically some uh, greetings from people who, who are watching uh, this lecture, lecture from Hidalgo, or Zacatenco, uh, El Politecnico, mm -hmm. and from other teachers that are basically saying hi. So I, I think- so My question for those who are out there listening, what I'd love you to say is, or ask, what, what's your reaction? Maybe it's just, what is your reaction to seeing those images, the images of schools before COVID and now in COVID? Do you feel like you see to me that we have a problem? <laughs> As I live in Houston, we like to say, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> do you see the problem and what do you see it as? Okay, okay. So we're, we're writing this question in Spanish too, uh, right now, so we can, we can have some answers. Uh, and, and when we do, I, I will tell you, I will let you know. Okay. So Ricardo, you've just seen this for the first time. Maybe you could just respond. What? What are some images? How, what are that? Those seeing those images. What, what was your thoughts? Okay. Well, uh, when when I saw that, I, I saw this problem uh, that we're having. It was uh, big in Mexico. Uh, but I. But when we think of other countries, we say, "Oh, that is not happening there." I mean, they they're not having these kind of problems. I mean, how can you think that they might have uh, some issues the way we we do? Okay. So uh, what I think calls our attention is that these kind of issues are happening in, in other countries too, mm. uh, and so we're not the only ones. So I think that's one, one of the things. That's a very good thought. Yeah. Uh -huh. Schools look the same almost everywhere. Right. Uh, and, and, and sometimes, uh, for example, I think these problems shouldn't have happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, you, you have been teaching about flip learning since some years ago. I mean, since a while ago. So maybe if we had listened to you before, <laughs> Or if, if we can, if we have done things like that before, yeah. when when we had these problems, we would be facing them. Uh, I mean, in a more mm -hmm. natural way, and we wouldn't be talking ab about uh, ab about a problem. We would be we wouldn't be saying that we having wasted time in in learning. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and you're talking about the risks that yeah. we have had and, and maybe sometimes people think that that we we have lost a lot in the learning of you know I, you, you say that ricardo and something interesting popped in my head just as the pandemic was getting started this was not original with me but one of the leading flipped learning people in the world tweeted this out they said the pandemic what flipped learning teachers have been preparing for for the past 10 years <laughs> You know, and I think that's another interesting uh, sort of uh, data point is I've talked with flipped learning teachers all over the world since the pandemic started, you know, two years ago now or whatever it's been now, is every single one of them. Now, this is hundreds of ones I've had interactions with has been asked by their school, by their university to help 
figure out how to do learning because they thought, oh, this guy knows what to do. This gal knows what to do. Help us out because they realized that flip learning could really help them with the pandemic. And it has. But still, there's many who need extra help. So tell you what, why don't we go back into the presentation, so right. to speak. Let me share some more. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I just, I'm, go I'm, I'm going to just mention a, a few questions that sure. uh, oh, yeah. came go. up. For example, Olivia Garduño, hi, this, uh, I feel worried. How can we support the learning gaps? We feel so, let me see, stressful. Mm -hmm. Then Minerva says, I think the the problem. I mean, this problem is a a, a worldwide problem. Okay. It is. Uh, Alex, uh, Alex, good Alex, news. Say excellent presentation. I'm I'm going to, and then, well, that's basically what we have. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, and I and, uh, yeah, I understand your nervioso. And the good news is, I am going to make an audacious claim that I know how to solve this problem, and I have some answers for you. And that's going to come in the next segment uh, of the presentation. And not only do I know it works, uh, I, I'm doing it every day with my students. And it works. I uh, just finished a book on the topic, which will be coming out next year. Um, anyways, yes. Uh, was there any other questions that you feel like needs to be talked about, Ricardo? Well, uh, Kenji Sato says, there, is no, there, there isn't a problem. There is evolution. Mm. that's what she said yeah that's a good point yeah we need to evolve and i i think i know what the next stage of evolution needs to look like so let's let's dive back into that okay so where are we going to look to find the answer you asked that you asked a great question you know hacia donde mirar where are you going to look and um i think what we need to do is miramos atrás right and we're going to look back to Benjamin Bloom. Now, you, everybody knows Benjamin Bloom was the creator of Bloom's taxonomy, Taxonomia de Bloom. But in reality, there's something else that he was much more passionate about than his Bloom's taxonomy. He wrote a paper in 1984 called The Search for Methods of Group Instruction as Good as One-on-One -on -one Tutoring. Sorry, it's cut off here. Uh, and in that paper, he, he called it the two sigma problem. So it's a mathematical term he uses, the two sigma problem. And he compared three different methodologies of learning. Now, this is a long time ago, 1984. Conventional learning gives you one curve. Mastery learning gives you the second curve, which is one standard deviation improvement in student achievement. And if you have a tutorial, a one-on-one -on -one tutorial, then it wins. Essentially what he said, is there a way? In fact, well, I'll just, here's the quote. He said here, if the research of the two sigma problem, let me back up. What he's trying to say is, is there a way as good as one-on-one -on -one tutoring where you know, you're, you're a wealthy family and you can hire a tutor? Now, most families cannot do that. That's the best way to learn. That's, that's what the research says. And he said, can we find a way though that's that good and not cost so much money, right? Not so many teachers necessary. And this is what he said. If the research of the two sigma problem yields practical methods that the average teacher or school faculty can learn in a brief period of time and use with little more cost or time than conventional instruction, it would be an educational contribution of the greatest magnitude. It would change popular notions about human potential and would have significant effects on what the schools can and should do with the educational years society requires of its young people. So he, it was like Bloom was challenging the world to find a better way to teach. And I'm going to be bold and say, problema resoluto. It's been solved. And it's not solved by flipped learning per se, but a combination of flipped learning with mastery learning, flipped mastery learning. All right. And Roberto, tell me if this doesn't work on that. Well, I want to show you a video from a double sigma classroom. Let's watch. Okay. Um, this class is more laid back. It's chill, but you're still learning. Like you're actually letting in the knowledge. It's like the flipped part of it. Like you're more independent and you can go at your own pace, but you're still on track. You can't fail. I mean, you kind of, it's 
I mean, it's kind of impossible to fail this class, to be honest, because you're literally given every resource possible to pass this class. Like, you are able, like, mastery, because you don't move on until you have mastered it. I mean, the test, not necessarily, but, like, your mastery quizzes, like, you know them in, like, the notes, and then the quizzes are, are with the notes, and, like, just every resource that you give us helps us to succeed. Like you know what you're going to be doing and you can go ahead. Like you go at your own pace. You can go ahead. You can be a little bit behind because you get time in class to also work on your stuff. We are capable of learning it on our own with all the resources that you give us. So this is a student in a class in Estados Unidos. Uh, from about four years ago in a double sigma classroom, a flipped mastery classroom. Uh, now, when I talk about flipped mastery, before we can talk about flipped mastery, let's take a brief moment and talk about flipped learning. And I'm gonna talk about the basics of flipped learning. We're gonna come back again to taxonomia de Bloom. And you are all familiar with this, I imagine, knowing that there are the levels recordar, comprender, aplicar, analizar, evaluar, crear. And if you spend, if you look at this chart, the vast majority of most teachers' class time, in fact, I will admit my class time, when I was a stand and deliver teacher, I spent most of my time at the bottom of rooms. But when I and Aaron Sams helped uh, pioneer flipped learning in 2007 and eight, uh, what we realized we were doing is we were flipping Bloom's taxonomy on its head. We were spending less class time on recordar y comprender and more time on aplicar y analizar. And that helped us to realize that the most valuable thing that a teacher has is that face-to-face -face time they have with their students. When that happened in the pandemic and I was remote with my students, uh, I still had face-to-face -face time with my students. It was just sitting here in my house in a Zoom room, but I still was able to do that. Uh, that's the big idea is that you wanna get the easy stuff. In fact, let me say this. There's also, I think, the ideal shape of Bloom's taxonomy, if the shape outline represents time, is to spend the bulk of your class time in the middle, medio de Bloom's, all right? Aplicar y analizar. And that's what happens in my class every day. My students are spending their time applying and analyzing, and they're using what uh, we say in the flipped learning world, the independent space when they're alone, working on the lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy, recordar y comprender. All right, so that's the basics of flipped learning. Let's mm -hmm. let's stop again for a Q&A. Actually, I said I was gonna give you the answer. Um, that's coming in the third segment, but let's, let's um, any questions or thoughts again? Para aquellos que no dominan el inglés, muy bien. Eh, más o menos hacer una recapitulación de lo expresado hasta ahora por el doctor John Bergman. Eh, miren, él ha empezado eh, esta eh, plática eh, hablando de que este problema que estamos enfrentando a raíz de la pandemia ha sido un problema mundial que de alguna forma no estaba preparado el mundo para esta situación y para trabajar a distancia. Entonces, de alguna forma, él dice, nos tomó eh, desprevenidos y sin la preparación suficiente. Eh, eh, por otro lado, él está también eh, recuperando eh, lo dicho por, por Benjamin Bloom, que es el que, el que habló de, de, que lo conocemos muy bien por la taxonomía de Bloom. Y él habla que, que el aprendizaje idóneo, pues es de un aprendizaje de un profesor por alumno. ¿Ok? Eh, y, y también trae los niveles cognitivos de los que hablaba Benjamin Bloom. Entonces, él está explicando cómo estos niveles cognitivos eh, tienen relevancia y, y tienen pertinencia en el método de aula invertida. Eh, y de, de tal forma que, que nuestro conferencista dice que la, que la parte de aplicar y analizar es a lo que más tiempo le dedica en su clase con sus alumnos. ¿Ok? Entonces, eh, hasta ahí eh, es más o menos lo, lo que él nos está presentando. Eh, agradecemos que sus eh, diapositivas también estén traducidas al español y de que él eh, está 
familiarizado también con, con esta lengua y, y eso también nos, nos habla de su generosidad y, y de la importancia también que le da a, a, al público que tiene la, eh, de habla eh, es, eh, en España, en español. Ahora, también aquí hay una pregunta. Uh, there's a question here uh, by Elvia Garduño. I'm going to read it. She says, how can I front the problems of reading comprehension to apply flipped learning? That's yeah, a yeah, question. perfect question. So in a flipped learning environment, the idea is you want to do the hard stuff with your students. And so my guess is if you're teaching them to comprehend literature, whether it's in Spanish or English or whatever it might be, you want to have them practice that your presence. I mean, the big idea of flipped learning is that you do the hard stuff when you're there as the teacher. Students do the hard stuff with you. They do the easy stuff when they're alone. And so if you would have walked into my class yesterday morning, you would have seen students doing the hard stuff with me walking around and helping my students. And the easy stuff, the uh, information transfer, they got that by watching those ahead of time on a video or reading some text. Okay, great. That's great. That, that's, it's, it's a simple idea, guys. It's not like rocket science to realize what's the best use of your face-to-face -face class time. I'm going to argue it's not you standing up and introducing new information. They can get that elsewhere, but when they're struggling to apply that information or to analyze that information, uh, that's where they need your help. So putting the right resource and who is the right resource? It is you, the teacher, a maestro or profesor. It's you who's the most important resource in that class. You need to help your students with the hard stuff. Go back to Bloom's taxonomy. Crear, aplicar, apli you know, analyzar. That's what you want to have them working on in the class. All right. Okay. Why don't we go back to the presentation again for, if you will, round three. So what is this answer? Remember, I've been saying that there's an answer to Bloom's double sigma problem. ¿Cuál es la respuesta? That's the answer. And I think it's when we combine flipped and mastery learning. This is what I believe has solved the double sigma class. Picture here of my classroom that I was in yesterday. Okay. And when we think about a flipped mastery classroom, so this is a combination of flipped and mastery. Uh, the first thing I want you to know is that there is no whole class instruction. I do not teach all my students at the same time anymore. You can see my students watching a video in class. They're not watching it at the same pace. They look the same. I make videos with a colleague and you can see what he has. We would make the videos. These are my students from last year. Of course, we're all masked because we did meet in person for part of the year. And but everyone was required to wear a mask. So there is no whole class instruction. They do this most of the time at home, but sometimes in a mastery class, you see, actually, let me back up and say mastery. A mastery classroom is the idea, and I'm sure you have this all, all countries. If you're going to get your doctors, become a doctor, you have to pass the big doctor test, right? Um, you have to pass your boards. I'm not sure if they're called the same thing in other countries, but in the United States, the doctor, to be a doctor, you have to pass the board exams. Or if you want to be a, a lawyer, you have to pass the, if you, if you don't pass this exam, you don't get to be a doctor. Uh, if you want to get your driver's license, you have to pass the driver's test. If you don't pass it, you, you can always take it again. And when you pass it, then you get to be a driver or you get to be a doctor or you get to be a lawyer. That's the same idea of a mastery classroom is the student gets to the end of a unit and they take a test. And if they pass the test, they move on. In fact, today, my students were taking their third test of the year. Uh, and some of them passed, the vast majority of them passed on their first attempt, but some of them did not. And that means they need help and we're going to remediate and get them some help. But notice there's no whole class instruction. The second thing that's important is that not every student is working at the same pace. They're working at a flexible pace. Now, I use the word flexible. Some people think, oh, everyone gets to work at their own pace. It sounds wonderful. But in my experience as a teacher, is if you don't give some students a pace, 
some of them won't have a pace. They will just stop working. And so I have students who are unmotivated. I don't know if you do, but I have students who are not motivated to learn. And so what I need to do is find ways to motivate them. And so I have to give them a pace. I've been back adjusting uh, how they're penalized for being for not keeping up. And what I've discovered is that some students struggle to keep up because they struggle with the content. And some of them struggle to keep up because they're not very motivated. And determining which one is which is part of the art, I think, of teaching and pushing them in the right way. The third thing that you see in a flip mastery classroom, I think is super powerful, is this idea of extreme differentiation. Let's watch a video of my class. Um, yeah. This was pre-COVID, uh, by the way. And hopefully what you're seeing is you're just seeing that I find that my job, I like to say it this way, is to roam. I walk around the room and help kids. And they're all at slightly different places in the curriculum. And I am helping them a little bit one at a time. One of the crazy awesome benefits of this is I get so much better teacher-student interactions. I get to help my students all the time. Here I'm working with physics students. They're doing some circuits. Uh, I just get to interact with them. I get to know them better. It's just magic, guys. Absolute magic. The thing that happens is students by nature are going to be working together. They collaborate together. Collaboration of student work. So the students here are working in a group, working together to figure out and solve problems. I'm there to help. Uh, and sometimes I help and sometimes I don't. I have to make that decision. Is it best for me or best for them, really, if I step in and intervene? Or do I need to just step back and let them learn on their own? I find the answer is it depends. Uh, formative assessment. So as I'm roaming, I haven't talked about this, but as I'm roaming, I'm spending the time. I, I carry a clipboard or an iPad. I've actually switched. I used to do a, in the image, the video you saw, I was using an iPad. I had a green iPad, if you recall. I've now switched to paper. I find just carrying around a clipboard. I've just got a clipboard that I carry around, and that's where I keep track of my students, and it just has been very effective. Old school, analog, I can keep really good track of where each student is at. Who needs, who's behind in their mastery journey? Who is ahead? Who's right on target? And what I do is I spend a fair amount of time at the beginning of every class figuring out who needs to be talked to first. It's almost always the kids who are behind in their learning. And then I can kind of push them and say, all right, what is it you're struggling with? How can I help you? For some students, they just need somebody to kind of walk around and, and encourage them. And some other students need uh, some strong encouragement. Although, let me admit, admit something that happened just this last week. I was... I had a student who I thought was really just slacking off. You know, I don't know if you've had a student like that. It's like, man, dude, you could do this, and you're just a total slacker. I didn't say that. Uh, but I said, you could do so much better. And then the, 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 the kid, he said, Mr. Bergman, do you know that when I go home, I have to take care? I'm like the dad to my little brother, and I have to work. And I've got all, the, I've got all these things, and I, I honestly, frankly, don't have time, all that much time to even devote to your class. And my whole perspective changed of this young man just the other day when I realized that I needed to find a better way for him to learn. And so he, he really gets the content fast. So what I decided to do with him is I said, tell you what, what if you did like a third of the questions in this uh, assignment? If you can prove to me you know how to do these, then you could skip these other questions. And he was like, really, you do that? I said, I don't care. How, I don't care where you learn, but if you know how to learn it, you don't necessarily do all this extra work. And those are the kinds of things that you have to figure out and uh, as you're doing mastery learning, and hopefully, yeah, you'll find that. Now, some assessments are interesting things. So like I said, my students are taking some of the tests today, tomorrow. I see my students every other day, so a bunch of kids tomorrow. And in my world, my students have to actually score an 80% on their summative assessments. So there's a, a young lady right there who's taking one of her summative assessments. They do it on a computer, and uh, they have to score 80. If she doesn't score an 80, she has to retake it. And uh, yeah. 
and so far in this year, every student has passed every single one of my tests with more than an 80 so far. And today, um, the more I took it, some of them didn't get an 80 on their first attempt, but they will certainly get it on probably the second or the third attempt. All right, and one of the tricks on how to make that work is the software that I use uh, allows me to have thousands of versions of the tests. So I don't know if you can kind of see this image, but the, the software I use, by the way, is uh, Desire to Learn Brightspace. And what I do is this, these are uh, chapter seven test or whatever. Um, notice that I've got 14 questions in 7.1 mole. You see that deal. Then what I'm expecting is the students are gonna give, get, I'm, I've written a lot of questions. I've written 14 questions. They're randomly gonna be assigned one of the 14 questions. That's the first question on the test. The second question, is a random question, one of 13. I think you get the idea. That means that every time a student sits down, they get a different test that tests the same content. Because if I gave them the exact same test, they would memorize the answers and not really learn it. And so software has really helped on it. Yeah, this whole issue. And then I, of course I'm giving immediate feedback. So this young lady has just taken her big test, right? Summative exam. And I am going over with it right that moment. And if she's struggling, I'm able to quickly ascertain. Now, normally in the old days, when I gave the same test on the same day, I wasn't able to do this. But since my students are staggered when they take the test. So as I know, I said, they're taking their test today and tomorrow, but that's not really going to happen. My students who are on target are going to take it today. Yesterday, I had students who took it and passed it and some who didn't. And I'll have some in the next class. So there's, there, it's staggered over a certain period of time. And then I'm able to spend individual time with every student going over their tests. And number 10, I gamified it. So I, I actually have a leaderboard. This is a copy of my leaderboard. And it shows where students are at each of these little, uh, there's little magnets that are in my room. They move their magnet when they uh, get past the next uh, assignment. And they love this little thing. It's just crazy. Let's let's do this. And then probably most important is it's relationship centered. I get to know my students so much better. It, it's just it's magic, guys. I would seriously, seriously encourage you to consider the idea of exploring flipped mastery learning because you'll get to know your students better and not just, you know, cognitively. Do they understand your material, your what you teach, whether you teach literature, or you teach history or you teach science or mathematics, whatever it is you're going to find that you get to know your students also on a more personal basis. And it's just humbling to me just how, how much my students are willing to tell me about their lives. And even yesterday as I was, I was with a young man and he was kind of sharing about the struggles of his life and he comes from a home where his father died. And my heart broke for this young man as I was with him and putting an arm around him. Yeah. So that's, that's the brief introduction of uh, flipped mastery learning. Let's stop again for some question and answer. Eh, principalmente los mensajes que hay de, son de felicitación. Most of the messages are, are, are just uh, congratulating the, the lecture. And I want to say the basic ideas that you have given in, in Spanish, so everybody can follow. Ok, uh, entonces, lo que ha dicho a, a grandes rasgos, está, está hablando de 11 puntos que, que voy a mencionar rápidamente. Lo primero que, que él comenta es que no todos los alumnos tienen que procesar la información al mismo tiempo. Entonces, él está eh, 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 enseñándonos unas imágenes donde, por ejemplo, los estudiantes están viendo un video, pero cada quien está viendo el video eh, de diferente forma. Algunos lo pausan, lo regresan, al, algunos lo, lo dejan correr, eh, porque cada quien tiene su, su forma particular de aprender, de, de tal forma que el aula invertida permite que cada estudiante vaya interactuando con la fuente del conocimiento, por ejemplo, en este caso un video, a, a su propio ritmo, de acuerdo con sus propias necesidades e intereses. Ese es el punto uno que mencionó. El punto dos es, no, no van a avanzar al mismo tiempo, o sea, no, 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 no van a aprender ni van a cumplir sus eh, objetivos de aprendizaje exactamente al mismo tiempo. O sea, esto en concordancia con el punto uno. 
y, y esto se debe de, 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 de ir permitiendo y contemplando en el método de aula invertida. Ok, y luego, número tres, que hay que hacer una diferenciación extrema de los estudiantes. Cada quien es diferente. Entonces, hay que contemplarlo y hay que tomarlo en cuenta en el proceso de aprendizaje y enseñanza. El punto cuatro es la interacción profunda que debe haber entre profesor y estudiante. Debe haber una interacción en todo el tiempo. O sea, no se debe de perder la comunicación. No estamos hablando en ninguna forma de perder la comunicación entre profesor y estudiante, sino al contrario. Número cinco, trabajo colaborativo. Debe estar también dentro de este método. Número seis, pues hay... Eh, eh, hay que contemplar también la evaluación formativa, que la evaluación formativa es aquella en la que se está midiendo la comprensión que el estudiante tiene del tema lo que, y que no implica una calificación. ¿okay? Y eh, después el punto 7 también es evaluación, pero en este caso ya sí la sumativa, que en donde sí ya, ya se debe de generar un puntaje. Ahora, en cuanto a, evolución, a la evaluación sumativa, eh, eh, hay, que, hay que ver que, que también está eh, 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 muy relacionada con el punto 8, que se llama que hay miles de versiones de los exámenes. Es decir, hay que evaluar de diferentes formas y siempre eh, cambiar, cambiar la forma. Para ello, una de las cosas que a mí me ha llamado la atención del doctor John Berman es que él utiliza mucho eh, diferentes aplicaciones. De acuerdo, por ejemplo, yo he aprendido varias aplicaciones con él. Aprendí Edpuzzle, por ejemplo, screen o matic que también él, él enseña. Y, y hay que seguir eh, eh, utilizando diferentes aplicaciones para, para poder eh, favorecer este proceso de aprendizaje y enseñanza. Luego, la, la parte del, del punto 9 es la retroalimentación inmediata. Eh, que vamos a, 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 a tratar en este método de en todo momento tener una retroalimentación. Las aplicaciones nos ayudan a tener la, la realimentación inmediata, los va a favorecer y sí se está esperando eh, eh, este punto. Después, número 10, que en la utilización frecuente de la gamificación o ludificación, ¿ok?, eh, es importante eh, utilizar la gamificación como, como una buena estrategia para motivar el aprendizaje de los alumnos. Y después él habla de, de un punto, el 11, que, que yo creo que es el punto fundamental y creo que ahí tiene él una, pues una motivación eh, muy grande al utilizar el método de aula invertida. Y el punto 11 es de que está centrado en la relación. Okay. La relación entre profesor y los estudiantes es fundamental. Todo este proceso debe acompañar esta relación okay. eh, para, que ellos, para que el profesor conozca a los alumnos, se preocupe por ellos, no nada más en el sentido de lo que están aprendiendo, sino de ellos como personas. Okay. So, basically, uh, what I have been saying, uh, doctor, is... Uh, I, I have been emphasizing uh, uh, some aspects of what you have said. One of the things is that, that you're always using uh, apps to, to make your job easier uh, and, uh, and to, um, to optimize what you do. For example, I remember uh, when I met you in the, La Universidad Iberoamericana, you taught us how to use Edpuzzle and screen omatic uh, which are very good um, yes. apps and 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 that's also a, a good strategy to optimize our learning i mean to use this kind of apps that that will help us uh, yeah. reach our goals okay so that that's one of one of the things that i wanted to mention another one is that it, it has to do with gamification that you mentioned and There is now a new tendency, a new trend that, uh, that is called neuroeducation 
uh, and of course, neuro education goes along with what you're saying. Uh, and, and they say that, that gamification is always is also oriented into into that. And of course, uh, when we listen to you, we know that that, that you're in the same page. Uh, and because gamification also attends the the emotions of the students, right? So and also you have that into consideration. It's clear for us. And then I, I'm saying that some of the great highlights of what you're saying is that that flip classroom it's centered on the relationship between the students and teachers. Uh, and, and you worry uh, about uh, the students' uh, well-being, not uh, only taking into consideration their learning of, of the knowledge, but also their, I mean, the, the, the being of the student as a whole. I mean, yeah. so we, I, I think that, that it's one of, of, the, of the concerns you have, thinking of the of the for, uh, of the education of a person of a whole being i don't know if you can tell us more about it yeah so let me uh -huh. say this as, as i've looked at the research on education and i've read them now for many years and maybe eight years looking at educational research and i'm going to simplify it here so if you're an uh, academic in the world you're going to probably <laughs> disagree but i think if you look at all of the educational research here's my summary it comes down to just two things. Number one, relationships. Students don't care what you know until they know that you care. And number two, active learning. So relationships plus active learning wins. And if you think about it, if, we, if you want to do gamification, active learning. If you want to do pro project-based learning, active learning. And I think flipped learning is an easy way to get to those things. And, and flipped learning is, is, by definition, active. You can't really not flip your class and not have an active learning classroom. And yeah, build relationships with students and have an active learning. And that's and that's not just me talking. This is this is research from hundreds and thousands of educational studies that says says that same thing. If you were to just if you're an educational researcher, I would challenge you to look at all the research and see if there's something that's outside of those two buckets, if you will. Yeah. Well, should we take any more questions or should I go to the last segment of my presentation? Uh, well, I, I think you, you should uh, go, uh, you should continue go on. Okay. And, and afterwards, I think uh, we will be able to, to discuss more, more questions. Your ideas. All right, let's go. So what I want us to do now is, this is a video of my class that I took uh, two weeks ago. Let's take a look at my class. So I hope you get the idea. My students um, are actively involved in their learning. And as I close out, I want us to think about some things. I, I think COVID has definitely been a tragedy. We've all had people 
I don't know if you all have, but we've certainly known people, my wife and I, who who've died of COVID, who've suffered. It's it's been a horrible thing for the world. But I also want us to not just look at the negative side. I want us to realize that COVID is also an opportunity. No perdamos esta oportunidad. It's an opportunity for us to rethink what education should have always been like. That's what I want us to do. And if we go back, when we go back, because <laughs> we will, pandemics all end eventually. But when we go back to school, I want us to not just go back to doing the old way, the old way. It doesn't work. You see, um, what I did is I, uh, before the pandemic, in preparation, honestly, for my TED talk, I asked, uh, I asked flipped learning teachers and flipped master learning teachers in particular to send me pictures. Remember the pictures we saw at the beginning of the presentation? I want to show you what a flipped learning class looks like, what a mastery learning class looks like. Here's a school in Iceland. This was a school for dropouts, students who struggled in school, went from one of the lowest schools. It's a, uh, it's a secondary uh tertiary institution so it's a it's like a polytechnic university and what they have done is been they went from the lowest scoring school to the highest one of the highest scoring schools in the entire country this is my one of the great flip learning teachers in the world joanne ward from taiwan take a look at these pictures a great he teaches uh, this is khalid he runs a school of english teaching students english in morocco Marukekos, singapore Iran, my friend Reza in his class, his kids are just always active in their learning. I had a chance to visit the uh, Escuela de Medicina de Harvard. Um, this is Dr. Richard Schwartzstein and I was blown away. They've, they've flipped Harvard Medical School. If you're in the university and you want, you want to stay up with the times, just check out what they're doing at Harvard. They're flipping, okay? Okay, this is the first flipped primary school, actually the first flipped school in all of New Zealand, Nueva Zelanda. And they are, it's a primary school, so, we, you know, kindergarten through se sixth grade or whatever. And they have become just the talk of New Zealand. And they've done mastery learning. Hong Kong, Nigeria, the United Kingdom, Reino Unido, España. Yes, España. By the way, Spain has taken off flip, flip learning. I wish I had the pictures. I just don't have them. I couldn't find them of the first flip school in Spain. I got a chance to visit this. Uh, they have just exploded where they just, uh, there's people dying. To, well, that's a bad word. <laughs> there's people who are just desperate to get into the school because it's so successful. Australia, in China, in, uh, this is near Chicago where I used to live, Argentina. Now here's an interesting story in, out of Latin America in particular, the largest instance of flipped learning is happening in Misiones, Argentina. Maybe you've heard of the Iguazu Falls. It is on the border of, of Brazil e Argentina, and they are flipping with 300,000 students. They're K-12 institutions. They started this program. I had a chance to go and work with them and consulted with them a few years back, and they, are, uh, they have like a six-year plan, and they are in about year three, and then COVID hit. Maybe now it's year four now, I guess. I've lost track. I have to go back and hit the math. But anyways, they, they were ready for the pandemic because they started the process four years ago, and uh, they've got a lot to learn. They figured out how to solve the problem with kids who have limited devices. It's a very poor part of Argentina. They figured this out ahead of time. It was just perfect timing for them. This is the first flipped university in the entire world. The complete university is flipped. It's MEF University in Turkey. Um, in Istanbul, I had a chance to visit the school. What an amazing things they're doing at this university. And then here's me, Klasse. Oh, I did want to say, I forgot about these. I want to mention a couple things, especially for those of you who are in the university. I got a chance to visit Universidad de Monash in Australia. It's the largest university in all of Australia. And uh, I got to visit uh, a class where they're doing some great work with flip learning. And this is an image from one of their flip learning classes. But then as I was going around, I was being toured by a professor who's the, maybe the top flipped professor at the university. He has a thousand students in his class uh, and he's flipped it and it's working brilliantly. But he said, John, let me just take you around. <laughs> and we walked into this room. This is I took this picture sitting in the back of the room. You can see how many seats there are. There's maybe 300 seats, and I don't know, you can count them. There's seven students. This professor was up there lecturing with all the big screens. 
and there were seven students there. Because you see what they'd done is they were recording the lectures, they were live streaming their lectures. This is pre-COVID, this is three years ago, four years ago maybe, I forget. And these students said, it's not worth my going to class for me to sit and hear a lecture. And, and, and you can see her percentage, this class was supposed to have 300 students in it. There are 300 students enrolled in this class, but they weren't in class. Well, maybe they were online, but the reality was they watched the recording later. Uh, what if she was to rethink how she did class and she used this time for active learning? That's the, what you need to think, guys. You don't, you don't want to become this class. You want to be this class. So, say el cambio. Each of you has a choice to make. And the choice is, are you going to be a part of the change? Are you going to go back to the way it used to be? I can't answer that for you. You have to answer it for yourself. And I highly encourage you to be a part of the change. We, we can't, we shouldn't go back to the old way that we taught before COVID, before the pandemic. It's time for us to upgrade our teaching. Si el cambio. Gracias. You can find me at johnbergman.com. I'd encourage you to go there. My, my website, there's been so much interest in my website, especially in Brazil, that I have actually have somebody translating into Portuguese. Maybe uh, somebody here could be the person to translate my website into Spanish. That would be awesome too. Uh, gracias. Eh, mire, eh, la, la mayoría de, de los comentarios son de, de felicitaciones. Eh, most of the comments are, are to congratulate uh, what, your lecture. And, and for example, uh, uh, Miss Marta Patricia Garcia Morales said, Dr. John, I imagine that the resources you use depend on the group of your students. Uh, uh, is that right? That, that's her question. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, yeah, the, the apps you use, the applications, yeah. I mean, how, how would you select what applications you would use? She assumes that that is depending of, of, your, of, the, of your student's profile. Yeah, and there's just not, I, I see lots of different, you know, tech tools that teachers are using as they flip their classroom. Some people use all Google stuff. Some people use all Microsoft stuff. Some people, for example, use Edpuzzle, like you say. Uh, I used to use Edpuzzle, and now I use one called Perusol. I decided I liked it better. It's similar, but has some other functions that I like. At some level, I'm not sure it matters. Um, I think it matters at an institution level. So if you're at a particular university, what I would encourage you is to sort of adopt one set of tools because then it helps the teachers who are struggling with tools to have other people to help them. So I think it streamlines that process, but at some level, it's not that important which tools you use. It's more important that you change how you think about what school is that matters. Okay. Okay. Uh, Minerva says, whether in personal or online, we must be more committed to our students to be able to support them. Okay. okay. And then Minerva, oh, she, she uh, again, Minerva mm. says the COVID epidemic gave us a great opportunity or challenge as teachers to evolve in the way we teach. We have to take advantage of it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to 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 also to recapitulate some of the of the mm -hmm. ideas given here uh, in Spanish. Okay. Exactly. Bueno, entonces una de las cosas que, ha, que han sido importantes en el discurso del doctor John Berman ha sido que él enfatiza eh, eh, la, la importancia de la relación que debe haber entre los actores en los procesos de aprendizaje e enseñanza. ¿ok? Una de las cosas que él dijo, eh, eh, tal cual, es, dice, a los estudiantes no les importa cuánto sabes, sino le, hasta que ellos sepan que tú les importa. ¿ok? Eh, entonces, eh, eso inclusive tiene que ver con lo que decía David Oswald, 
desde, desde hace muchos años que, que decía que eh, las, las clases tienen que tener un componente afectivo, ¿ok? O lo que decía Gabriela Mistral, de, eh, de, que si no puedes amar mucho, no enseñes a jóvenes. So, I, I'm, I'm mentioning right now that, that you said that students don't care uh, how, how much the teacher knows until they know that the teacher cares for, for them okay and and i'm and i'm saying that david osbell i mean uh, the the one that that teaches or the one that proposed um uh, significant uh learning a long time ago he used to say that that there is a very important component in the learning process that has to do with affectivity okay mm -hmm. so the, and, and also there's a, Ch a chilean teacher uh, uh, called gabriela mistral that that said that uh, to teach it's important to love a lot i mean a good teacher must be a good a good to love okay mm -hmm. so that has to do a lot uh, uh, with what, you, what you're saying And yes. uh, also, um, in español, les comento que el doctor dice a los profesores que sean el cambio, be the change, ¿ok? Ustedes tienen que ser el cambio. Eh, hay, hay, hay situaciones diferentes que están pasando que, que nosotros no podemos cambiar, pero tenemos que hacer lo posible para nosotros mismos ser el cambio, ¿ok? Uh, ahora... Um, and there is another question by Eva Chavez Guadarrama. She says, Professor Berman, could you please mention the main differences between flipped learning and education based on a face to face me traditional methodology? So I still believe in face to face teaching. Uh, but what I happen, as you see my class, I don't stand up and deliver new information. Uh, I still believe students need to hear new information. I believe in the power of lecture, but my lectures are on videos. I've made these video lecture videos. They're short, students watch them, so that in class, they can wrestle with the difficult concepts. In a traditional classroom, you spend most of your time teaching the stuff, and then you send them home or a way to do the more difficult tasks. In my class, they're doing the hard things with me present so that when they get stuck, and they get stuck, I'm there to help them and rescue them. It's so much more effective and efficient. And, and we could talk if it matters, but if you look at the research on flipped learning, and there are now over a thousand peer reviewed studies on flipped learning that basically says it works. And it works in every subject, whether you're teaching history or engineering or languages or science or mathematics or primary school students or middle school students or university students, or there's even studies that talk about like adult learning at uh, corporate level. So it, it works in every subject at every level. It just works. And it, because it makes sense, it's super, I mean, come on, think about it. When you're stuck, you need the expert with you to be introduced to the new material. You don't need, need me. You can do that alone. But when you're stuck, I'm there to rescue you. That's the idea. Okay, great. Okay, uh, Marta Patricia Garcia Morales said the affective part is a missing point in traditional education, and now is is starting to be considered, and therefore is going to be uh, stronger or or strength. Okay. Yeah, indeed. The, this is the the time is now. El tiempo es ahora. Exacto. <laughs> to cambio educación. It's time to change education now. If there's ever been a time for us to make the change, it is now. And the pandemic has accelerated the change that was already happening when we started this movement in 2007. Uh, it grew and grew. And then I think some people kind of started to forget about it. But then when the pandemic happened, we said, oh my gosh, we need this so badly. And you need this so badly. But you don't just need this so badly because of the pandemic. You need it after the pandemic. 
Right. Because it works and it works better than the old way. Right. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, Dr. Berman, uh, you know, I have listened uh, to many teachers uh, talk about flip learning and everything. Uh, sometimes it's like a fashion, you know, everybody talks about, about the new trends, you know, and like also now many people are talking about neuro, neuro education and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes what happens is that they talk about it because they want to look trendy sometimes, but, but they don't know how to start with it. Uh, I mean, they talk about it, but they don't do it. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, and the institutions also are like that. Oh, they talk about uh, the new trends, but but when you see the the the, the lessons, they are traditional sometimes, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, so thinking of teachers that that are interested in applying uh, this this method. But they don't know how to start because sometimes uh, we talk about concepts and and but but sometimes it's good for them to know like in a in a more basic way like step by step uh, how to start how, how to well, let me to... recommend this um, uh -huh. so I wrote a book uh, one of my books I wrote a book that's only written in Spanish. So I wrote it with my friend, mi amigo, uh, uh, Dr. Raul Santiago, professor okay. of the Universidad de Rioja in España. And I just put the link to the book. It's called Aprender al Revés, I, one of the best books I feel I've ever written. Uh, and I wrote it with, with Raul. And um, I put it in our private chat. So there's a way for you to put it in the main comment section so they could yeah. see. Uh, Aprender al Revés, written by Bergman y Santiago. And I would, I think that's a great place to get started uh, for those of you who want a book in Spanish. Certainly my other books, Flip Your Classroom is written in Spanish as well and translated into Spanish. Uh, you can certainly get all the English versions um, and particularly the mastery book. Let me just at least give you a, a heads up. Um, I, on my computer this morning, I'm doing the final draft of a book. Um, it is done without, I, I have three or four more hours of work. That's all I have to finish a book on the flipped mastery learning. It'll be published sometime next year, uh, maybe March, April, something like that, by my publisher. And uh, I have four more hours and then it's, then it goes to editors and things like that. So there, it's not immediate, but in terms of my my work on this book is, is almost done. And I think that would be a great book to get pick up if you speak English, hopefully the book will get translated into Spanish once it's out. Uh, it'll be called something like the, the handbook yeah, of mastery learning. I think that would be a great book to get picked up in. And, and so I would highly encourage you to pick that up sometime next year. You should certainly go to my website, johnbergman.com. And if you sign up, you'll get free newsletters. You'll know when books come out or when I publish, I have a blog that you can listen to and or I have a podcast that's on the website. And I also have a blog, both a blog and a podcast that I would encourage people to jump onto. My website is just my name, johnbergman.com. Um, John has no H and Bergman has two N's, so watch that. But you can find me. You can I'll put that in the chat too. Okay, okay, that's great. Um, and 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 also uh, when when you show pictures of of how how uh, of people interacting with flipped learning around the world, uh, I mean, I'm curious. I mean. Would, would you think of, of differences in culture, uh, in different cultures that we have maybe as Latin American countries from other countries? Uh, how, have you found a difference regarding uh, our cultures? How different? Yes and no. So. Honestly, what I felt like I've seen in Latin American cultures is I feel that Latin American cultures are much more interactive. Uh, you are much more of a social culture than the Estados Unidos. I wish the United States would be more social. And I think that what I've seen effective classrooms in America, what I have seen is 
the kinds of things you saw in the pictures of my class, but I think it happens more easily and more readily there than it does in the United States, where it's much more of an individualistic culture. You know, I don't know if you've seen the continuums. There's some cultures that are individualistic and some that are more, I think the word is community orientated or something like that. And in Latin American cultures, I think this is even a better solution. Um, I think it's going to, it's, it's, it's easier to adopt in Latin American cultures. That said, and I've also seen a lot of pushback and reticence from the, especially the university system in Latin America, who wants the professors want to be the ones with all the knowledge to stand up in front and be the professor. Uh, but I think they need to give that up <laughs> to be nice. I'm not being nice, actually. Uh, they need to give that up so that the students can actually have more control of their learning. Uh, because I think you'd be really surprised. Uh, I know you would be about how amazing your students are and what they will learn if you give them some more control. But so I, I've seen it work in all cultures. So I, you know, I, I have lots of examples from Latin American cultures. I've done a lot of work with some universities in Monterrey, Mexico, um, and uh, know that it's worked very well there. Uh, I've been to Pueblo, uh, Mexico, Mexico City multiple times to share the same idea. I know it works um, in but all of Latin America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brazil has taken off like fire, Argentina. I was in Colombia right before the pandemic, saw how they're adopting it rapidly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bueno, pues miren, queridos profesores, eh, vamos a tratar de aprovechar eh, to, todos estos, estos conocimientos de la mejor forma y ponerlos en el aula porque... Eh, Creo que aquí la idea es simplemente ya empezar a actuar y ser el cambio, como lo está diciendo el, el doctor John Berman. Eh, y en ese sentido creo que es obligatorio leer el libro. Ya está el vínculo ahí eh, en el chat. Eh, creo que ya, que ya lo puse, ¿verdad? El, el vínculo. Entonces, pues vamos a, vamos a hacerlo, vamos a hacer la gran diferencia eh, vamos a empezar a trabajar con esto. Uh, and doctor, uh, I, I really want to thank you a lot. This is this has to be a great contribution to the symposium, and I think it's going to change the way uh, we teach. Let me tell you, I you have changed the way I teach. I mean, mm. you have made an impact on on me, and. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think in the same way uh, you're impacting many people's lives. And, and when you impact uh, the lives of teachers, also you're impacting the lives or their students mm -hmm. of the teachers. So it's a, it's a great impact. Uh, the link of your book is already on, on, the, on the comments. And we're going, we will be sure that, that everybody gets it because we read, I mean, I'm telling the, the teachers, I mean, they have to read the book. I mean, the, I mean, in order to, to really change the way yeah. we th they teach, in order to improve the, the, the way, in order to upgrade the, the lessons, okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, you, you don't know how grateful we, we are. Uh, we really appreciate your 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 generosity okay uh, mm. thank you so no, much. And, and it's, 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 it's awesome I, I really appreciate your kind words it means a lot to me and it's you know guys i yo soy maestro simple i am just a simple teacher like you and uh i am blessed that i helped start a movement and i but my hope and my the passion of my life is to see all of us, todos los mundos, todos los maestros y profesores y profesoras, uh, to cambio como uh, enseñar, to change how we teach. It's time. Ahora yeah. tiempo. Mm -hmm. Es tiempo de ser el cambio. Okay. Yeah. Gracias. Okay. Gracias. Cuarto Simposio Internacional SOMESI 2021. Transformación digital.
Digital e Innovación Educativa.